It didn't take a trained eye to tell it looked pretty rough. A man had to have vision to settle along the banks of the Columbia River in the Wenatchee Valley in the late 1800s. The hard rock and placer miners moved towards the news of the latest strike. When the diggings played out, some moved on, and some stayed to make a town. The old timers could tell you, the land was ready for the hardy who had a grub stake and the grit to settle a sagebrush frontier, and a town began to grow. Most of the early homesteading was done in the valleys and canyons. A man could direct the natural gravity flow of a creek or small river. The soil was rich enough for farming, and the timber, the timber was there for the cutting. What a man could get done in a day's time depended on his muscles, determination, and how long the light held out. Well, it didn't take long for early settlers to recognize that the Wenatchee Valley was naturally suited for the growing of fruit trees. And on the ranch, the ladies were starting to talk about electric lights folks were burning on the other side of the mountains. Word was they were using creek water out of Gallagher Gulch and Tacoma to generate power for electric lights. At other social gatherings, some of the boys didn't seem to be all that concerned about changing the course of the creek. In 1901, electric pioneers looked to the Squilchuck Valley for the first source of Wenatchee power. A telephone electrician from the Midwest, Morgan Muller, and a school teacher and druggist, L.V. Wells, set out to harness the waters of Squilchuck Creek. The plant was at the mouth of Pitcher Canyon on the Old Compton Place. From the headworks, three and a half miles up the valley, water was diverted into an open canal, around the hill to a reservoir, where it entered a pipe, and turned a Pelton water wheel to generate electricity. The plant created a lot of community interest. People <laughs> gathered from miles around. But as one local resident recalls, a visitor wanted to be careful out there. And then uh, went through the power plant, through this turbine, and out in the spillway, and then down the creek again. And the water that came through that plant and out in that spillway, well, you wanted to watch your step. If you ever got caught in it, you were gone. The name of the company was Wenatchee Electric Light and Power. And the little power plant with 50 kilowatts of generation came online in January 1902. And everything worked fine till the cold weather and the ice came. The first winter, when the uh, creek froze up and they couldn't make any more power, they made a deal with Mr. Morrison to use a steam engine that he had in his sawmill. They belted the steam engine to the generator and they ran it 24 hours a day. By 1903, the company had new owners. Arthur Gunn and Charles F. Brown purchased the utility and shortened the name to Wenatchee Electric Company. President Gunn immediately set out to improve the power project, covering the ditch to prevent winter freeze-ups, building a new powerhouse, and adding a 180 kilowatt generator. Dedication day was Thursday, July 28th, 1904. From the pages of the Wenatchee Republic comes this account. Wenatchee made another great stride toward her goal as the metropolis of central Washington last week when the water was turned for the first time upon the powerful water wheel, the Wenatchee Electric Company. Power and light and ample quantity and at reasonable rates can now be secured at any time. The dingy kerosene lamp and the dangerous gasoline torch will be known in Wenatchee no more, while small manufacturing will take an enormous growth with an abundant supply of cheap electric power. Most everything was just lights. And the rates were 25 cents per light per month. 25 cents for each bulb. Of course, everybody just had one light hanging on a drop cord in the middle of the room. So by 1904, a pattern of electrical use was begun, with roughly 200 electric lights burning in the city at 25 cents a bulb, while a man's wages were about 17 cents an hour. But the supply couldn't quite always meet the demand. There was an old saying around Wenatchee that when the Comptons watered their cows, the electricity in Wenatchee went off. Electric lights in town were quite a novelty and a real convenience, so it wasn't long before more folks wanted more electricity for more lights. With a Squilchuck hydroelectric plant operating at capacity, developers turned to steam. In 1908, Wenatchee Electric installed a 200 kilowatt coal-fired gas turbine in downtown Wenatchee at a cost of $60,000. While many early power developments were constructed solely for the generation of electricity, others took advantage of existing civil works. Such was the case with George Gray and Son, who operated a sawmill near Indiat. The name of the firm was Indiat Lumber and Power Company. 
The powerhouse was installed next to the milling operation, a short distance from where the Indiat River joins the Columbia. The Grays installed a generating unit in 1904 to provide power for electric lights in Waterville. Large wooden transmission towers supported the line across the Columbia River. Five years later, in 1908, the plant was sold to George D. Brown of Chelan and J.G. Kennedy of Waterville, who formed the Brown Electric Company. A mile and a half further up the Indiat River, two Seattle men, M.D. Barish and A.B. Gray, were drawing up plans for a more substantial power plant. They formed the Indiat Light and Power Company in early 1908. That same year, construction was started following the sale of the company to J.C. and J.H. Stout. In those days, a horse with a single scoop wasn't a new flavor at the local ice cream parlor. It was a backbreaker, paying $2 a day, plus the hay for the horse. A low rock crib dam was built on the Indiat River and water was diverted into a canal over a mile long. To prevent erosion, nearly all the canal was lined with one-inch cedar boards. At the lower end of the canal, a reservoir was constructed nearly 40 feet in diameter and 8 feet deep, and the word was that the reservoir also doubled as the local swimming hole. From the reservoir, a wood stave pipeline 8 feet in diameter traveled another 1,700 feet to a powerhouse along the Indiat River. The pipe formed a Y just before entering the powerhouse and diverted water to drive two separate turbines. Although the capacity of both generators combined was 1,200 kilowatts, the project was only capable of generating 950 kilowatts with the available river flow. During the winter months, generation was even less due to low water. Power from the plant was sold primarily in the Wenatchee area. As the Indiat Light and Power Company was looking forward to the construction of their plant, plans were unfolding for the construction of this powerhouse near Dryden on the Wenatchee River. To three businessmen, Frank Schiebel, Marvin Chase, and W.T. Clark, the High Line Irrigation Canal appeared to be an ideal source of falling water for the generation of electricity. So in 1907, they formed the Valley Power Company and acquired the beginning section of the High Line Canal with the agreement that they would supply the irrigation company with water while using the balance of the flow for power generation. Water was diverted by a low rock-filled crib dam which crossed the Wenatchee River at Dryden. From the dam, water was regulated into the entrance of the canal through a set of timber headworks. From the headworks, water was channeled into a canal about a mile in length downstream to the powerhouse site. Wood stave penstocks directed the flow into the power station, which housed three generating units having a combined capacity of 1,200 kilowatts. As a safety measure, a set of overflow gates spill the powerhouse water during times of emergency shutdown. As with the squilchuck and Indiat generating stations, freezing temperatures and ice hampered operations. The plant wasn't all that reliable. The power would be off for days at a time, always in the wintertime. In 1908, the Valley Power Company was sold to R.T. and W.D. Lovell and Hubert Remley. The power was marketed in Kashmir, also in Wenatchee through the Wenatchee Electric Company. Meanwhile, in 1907, the Great Northern Railway Company was setting up camp a few miles west of Leavenworth along the Wenatchee River and gearing up for construction of what was hailed to be the largest hydroelectric plant west of Niagara Falls. Well, the mere thought of a dam to impound the Wenatchee River turned a lot of heads. Some of the locals were excited about the business opportunities. Others, others took a more wait-and-see attitude. Groundbreaking for the project was July 6, 1907. The Great Northern's plan was to use the power to electrify three miles of line through the old Cascade Tunnel to eliminate the serious smoke and gas conditions resulting from the coal-burning locomotives. Four new 100-ton electric locomotives were designed and constructed to pull the trains through the mountains. A dam 400 feet in length was constructed across the Wenatchee River. It took over 100 men, 12,000 barrels of cement, and $100,000 to complete the river crossing. From the dam, water was delivered to a powerhouse over two miles downstream through a pipeline eight and a half feet in diameter. Most of the pipeline was constructed of wood staves with the exception of the last 700 feet, which was made of riveted steel. A bridge 300 feet in length was constructed across the Wenatchee River to bring the pipeline to the powerhouse. Over 200 men were required to construct the pipeline. However, winter and spring slides along the pipeline route kept crews busy. 
The powerhouse was a concrete and brick structure that housed three Pelton water wheels and three 2,000 kilowatt generators. When the power went off and that those generators shut down real quick, the water came up the center pipe and spilled over and went down and squirted out across the river. And it got a fisherman or two there, soaked him plenty good because they weren't expecting that that pipe to squirt out on them. <laughs> Prior to the construction of the Tumwater Dam and Power Plant, the railway had agreed to construct at its own expense a smaller generating project a short distance downstream of the Great Northern Powerhouse. This small generating facility was turned over to the Tumwater Light and Water Company upon completion in 1912 in exchange for land and water rights required by the railroad. Power was supplied to the Lamb Davis Lumber Company, the Leavenworth train station, and the city of Leavenworth. The intake to the small plant was just a few hundred yards below the Great Northern Powerhouse, and it had its share of problems, too. From the intake, a self-regulating flume extended a short distance to a wood stave pipeline, which joined with the powerhouse a third of a mile downstream. The powerhouse itself contained a single water wheel and one 200 kilowatt generator. I was probably uh, four or five years old, and uh, there was a swinging bridge that went across the, the river to get over to the plant. My uncle came across to meet us. He carried me across that, that bridge. I can recall it very well, and uh, I can remember how I hung on, because that water underneath us was churning white water. I, th I thought we never would get across there, but we made it all right. The beginning rate for electric light service from the Tumwater Light and Water Company plant was 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Further north, the Chelan River presented a unique opportunity for hydroelectric development. The river had a 400-foot fall from the lake to the Columbia River and a total flow equal to that of the Wenatchee River. But the key was storage. With storage, the site offered a reliable, predictable, and sustained withdrawal of water 365 days a year if, if you could tame it. As early as 1892, attempts were made to dam the river near its outfall from Lake Chelan for navigation. The plan was to regulate the lake level so early steamers could not only land at Lake Park, now known as Lake Side, but also in the shallower Chelan area near the bridge. Each spring, the dams washed out. It was in 1901 that the town of Chelan constructed a splashboard dam that held. That same year, the Chelan Water Power Company, headed by M.M. Kingman, was the first to bring electricity to Chelan. Dad said, I remember your, your birthday real well because on that day I took a walk down the river to locate where we were to put in this power plant and he said I did that I, I remember coming back and finding you here that happens to be November the 16th 1901 on November 10th 1902 Chelan Water Power Company was granted a 50-year franchise to serve the Chelan area about a quarter mile down below the river mouth a diversion flume was constructed at a bend in the river a 250 horsepower generator was installed in a small powerhouse. The plant operated until nine each evening. Unless, of course, there was dancing at the auditorium, in which case, they passed the hat. About nine o'clock at night, the man that operated the plant would go home. He lived down there, but he shut the plant down. But on a, on a weekend, when they would have a dance or something, they'd want to stay there longer. And so they chip in and pay the operator an extra dollar or whatever it was to get him to stay on. It was a, it was a very crude beginning, but uh, it was electricity. In the early 1900s, there were no electric heaters. As with the rest of the county, electricity was pretty much for lights only. I can remember in Chelan here, when you'd get up in the morning and you'd look out over the few houses in town, you'd see smoke spiraling up from their chimneys, and they were wood fires, and you knew about what time so-and-so got up by the smoke <laughs> coming out of the man's chimney. In 1906, the Chelan Water Power Company was acquired by the Great Northern Railway and operated under the name Chelan Electric Company. The Great Northern acquired the water rights along the Chelan River during the early 1900s, anticipating expansion of its lines and providing a power source for future railway electrification. On the lower end of the Chelan River, near a point where it joined the Columbia, the year, 
was 1898, and R.T. Murdoch, James Marshall, and George D. Brown formed the M.M. and B. Company and started the first flour mill in the county and put a small hydroelectric generator adjacent to the mill. The generator provided lights for the milling operation and the house next door. In late 1902, the mill and the little power plant were sold, becoming the Chelan Falls Milling and Power Company, with George Brown becoming a major stockholder. About 15 years later, the mill was destroyed by fire. Actually, he was in Spokane the time it burnt. And I always remember father telling about it. He, father got on the phone and called him and said that the flour mill burnt. And his only question was, did it burn to the ground? Father said, yes. He says, well, no sense coming home. I'll be home next week. <laughs> it was like, he was quite a guy, guy <laughs> actually. The mill was not rebuilt. When Brown returned home, he incorporated the Chelan Falls Power Company in 1918. He leased additional water rights from the Great Northern Railway, the owners of the Chelan Electric Company. Within a year's time, he designed and constructed an improved intake and water diversion system and a power generating station at the town of Chelan Falls. The new project features included a timber head